Welcome to the Millionaire Next Door podcast with Robert Curtis, CFP, accredited investment fiduciary from Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. In this podcast, we help successful wealth accumulators like you looking to transition to a work optional lifestyle by helping you build strategies for growing and maintaining your wealth. Robert draws from years of experience and fiduciary responsibility and interviews guest experts to help you build reliable strategies to grow and maintain your wealth. Now, on to the show. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Millionaire Next Door podcast. We have a terrific guest today, so I'm really excited to share that with you. We're going to have a discussion around estate planning. This is a core area that we deal with. It's right in our firm's name, Signature Estate and Investment Advisors. We've always done it, but now we have some additional resources on the team in our firm. We have actually started our own Department of Estate Planning. Today, we're joined by April Rosenberry. She's the Director of State Tax and Financial Planning at SEIA. Uh, she's part of my value-added support team, and we have so many conversations, so it's going to be a huge resource for us. She's a JD. She's an attorney. In addition, she has an LLM. That's like a master's in taxation. So a lot of depth, and we can incorporate that into client conversations where it's appropriate. Welcome, April. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be on your podcast and continue our conversations and provide some good information for everyone out there. Perfect. That's exactly what we do. So I'm going to let you sort of launch in, maybe talk about the vision for the Department of Estate Tax and Financial Planning, you know, what we can do. Just go right into it. And I know you were going to cover some upcoming tax law changes, et cetera. So I'll let you have the floor for a bit here, share some good info. I am very excited to have joined SEIA, and this department is really going to bring together the different areas of expertise I had while I was a practicing attorney, both from tax law and my litigation background. So really the vision for this department is taking all the great work that the advisors do from a finance perspective and coming alongside and really supplementing that with holistic reviews of estate plans, having very detailed talks about tax, estate and tax, and then how to incorporate all of the great work from the financial plan that advisors do into a client's estate plan. In that realm, there is just so much space and conversation that we can have about estate planning basics, estate planning advanced topics, estate planning when it comes to a first or second death of a spouse and what to do for tax planning, how to keep some of the vultures at bay, if you will, from a trust litigation perspective, and really just trying to tie in these three different components, financial planning, tax, and then estate planning, while there are three different components, they run together in the same circles. And so I think that's the exciting part as we start this new year with this new department. A hundred percent. I've been doing this 26 years now with second and third generation clients. There is sort of the legalese and the documents, but there's the real life integration of this, the actual planning the family legacy, and to have somewhat of a buffer and assist people through that so that they're not just going in on the clock at very expensive rates, not knowing what they're doing, but to have some guidance along the way, I really think that's going to bear some tremendous fruit and probably lead to some better outcomes and lower a lot of anxiety for folks. So I'm super excited, but please continue on. You bring up anxiety, and I think one of the things for my vision for the department has been being in the peace of mind business, right? There's so many worries, anxious thoughts, 
just all the different horror stories you might hear or just the lack of knowledge that's surrounding a state and the estate tax, which I know we'll talk about, that really, I think, giving each client some peace of mind around what's my next step or what is the roadmap to take, I think is going to be hallmark and doing it in a way that's customizable. Every advisor here, very learned, understands all the different finance and estate and tax issues, but really taking it to the next level and giving a client a very customized experience. Every client's different, every family's different. In this department, we'll utilize technology, a company called Vanilla, to extract information from estate plans and build part of the reports that we can show clients with actual charts and dollars and cents. And I think that will help translate some of the legalese that my world loves to use, all these big words, legal words, into everyday applicable language that clients can understand and actually visualize. And I think that's also gonna be very helpful to see their estate plan in action what does it mean to my kids? That sort of thing. For sure. And listeners may not fully get this, but we're actually integrating top level, highly experienced professionals with some latest stuff in, believe it or not, artificial intelligence. I always try and cover that a little bit with every guest because it's so pervasive, but how do you utilize that? But in a customized way, I, I love some of your verbiage, you're holistic. You call this, you know, a hallmark process, customization of the experience. That's exactly what we do. So we're right on the same page. I'm super excited to have an additional sort of member and focus within the value added support team that I can utilize when clients are at that point in their life. We find as life unfolds and needs evolve, we often feel the need to bring in different parts of the process. At other times, they may not need all these elements, but we'll we know when to activate that. And April is going to be a huge resource. So back to you. Yes, that's true. And I think clients will need us in different ways at different points in their life. Candidly, maybe some or more than some of our clients might be in a space where they don't know where to start. They might have no estate plan in place. That's common, right? Busy business people tend to maybe not have an estate plan and that's okay. We'll get you to the right place to get one. Or maybe they have an estate plan and it's old. They lost it. They're not sure if it's still applicable. Or maybe they've had a life change. Maybe there's a divorce or a death. And, and so each of those separate types of categories bring separate levels of questions or worries. And so being able to say, no matter what's happening in your life, where you are, we'll meet you where you are and help get you to the next great step, get you to the finish line, which is an estate plan that works for you. And I know some clients already have a great estate plan and now their worry is what is happening with the estate tax law? And so that has been this month's biggest topic from client meetings, which is, I hear the estate tax law is changing. I hear a lot of things on the radio or in the news during debates, presidential debates, et cetera. And what does this mean for me? I don't know what to do. It's all very confusing. And so I think that's also going to be a place where we can really get our clients to the next level with who actually needs to do something now. Yeah. As we head into this, some things could be changing. We won't know for a while, but do you want to lay the framework for that a little bit? What might be changing? What should folks be doing or thinking about now? The types of conversations they should be having? I think that's a great segue into the tax realm. We talk about federal estate tax. There are some states that have a separate state level estate tax or inheritance tax. That's a separate conversation. There's only a few states, but everyone, no matter what state you live in, needs to at least be mindful of the federal estate tax. So this is a tax on your estate when you die. This year, 
and the previous years, the estate tax exemption, so meaning you can get to a certain level and not be subject to tax, has been increasing. So this year, we are at $13.61 million per person or $27 million and change for a married couple as the exemption level. So that means if you're a state, if you truly are the millionaire next door and don't have too many more millions after that millionaire, then your estate won't be subject to estate tax if, you, if someone passed away this year. So the general trajectory has been upward, but that law that has continued to increase our exemption is set to sunset by operation of its own language at the end of 2025. And so beginning in 2026, this estate exemption is going to drop down to 5 million per person or 10 million per married couple adjusted for inflation. So under today's standards, maybe in 2026, we would be looking at about a $7 million exemption per person. And that means Right now, there's a huge exemption. In 2026, there'll be a less exemption. And the IRS has said in a regulation, if you do some planning today, some fancy advanced planning today, to use up the exemption that is currently very high, we won't come back in 2026 or subsequent years and claw back that fancy planning and try to tax you in a way that would negate the planning you do right now. So I like to tell people it's a use it or lose it situation. For those clients that maybe are north of $10 million in estate net worth, now we need to start thinking about some potential additional things to do to get you out of that potential danger zone. And I do think this concept of estate tax can be confusing or hard to figure out or sometimes just not easily digestible. So sometimes I use a very simple example, easy numbers for me to try to hammer it home. And I think we can just look at it in this way. Say there's a married couple, they're worth $20 million. If they both passed away this year, their $20 million estate would not be taxed because the exemption level is 27 million and change. Fast forward to 2026 under this current law. If that same couple with 20 million passed away in 2026, the exemption level is just say 14 million for a married couple with inflation. Suddenly their $20 million estate is taxable they could use up a $14 million exemption, which means they're left with a $6 million taxable estate. And the hard part on that is the estate tax rate is 40%, which means there is a tax bill of 2.4 million. And I think that little example just shows, wait a minute, the difference of two years can cost my estate or my heirs more than $2 million. That seems not fun. And what can I do about that? Yeah, and there's a lot of folks I see that, I mean, these sound like high numbers to some folks, to others, if they have some real estate or whatnot, it's not that high or highly appreciated stock. There's others that I see maybe a couple has 3 million bucks. Maybe they own a home in Southern California, right? Or another piece of real estate. Maybe they have somebody's father has an estate that's, you know, worth three or four million, but not everyone on the parent side is coupled up either. Those amounts could go down, but all of a sudden with some inheritance, they could easily jump over that number. So it could be a big drop. And I could see where that would apply a little bit more broadly than thinking, hey, well, I'm just below these numbers. You can get there through transitions, but keep going. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I think for those of us in California, and maybe other states, of course, as well. Holding one piece of property can sometimes kick people into what we call the danger zone, or as you say, inheriting from family members 
or having a business that just does super well or a stock that just takes off from an investment, it's not unreasonable that many people could meet this threshold of estate taxation in 2026 or beyond, depending on where the law takes us. And it's not inconceivable that the estate tax exemption would be low. When I started my practice more than 25 years ago, the exemption levels were in the hundred of thousands, right? Of course, now I've dated myself, yes. But you can see that d depending on who's in charge of Congress and lots of other different factors that go into this melting pot that we call the tax code, the numbers can, can fluctuate wildly between zero, a few hundred thousand, up to the double digit millions. Having an estate plan that's flexible enough to kind of dodge and pivot with whatever the laws are going to be is also crucial. You don't want to paint yourself into a corner, but you also you want to take advantage of kind of the free tax money, if you will, that's out there. Right. So we'll help people or you'll help people through that process together so they know how to plan around that and if it applies. Yeah. That's really good. Where I have seen people start to flourish currently under some current client meetings that we've talked to people about is just saying we, myself, your advisor team, all of us here in our different roles at SEIA come around you and can really make sure that your plan is built out in a way where we are forward thinking about where your projections might be from a financial standpoint, and then making sure that our information and thoughts around your estate plan first have a solid base, and then finding the resources for options that might apply to you. There are so many things clients can do for advanced estate planning, from the very simple to the extremely complex. Sometimes I've seen already clients start to get overwhelmed by options. It all sounds like tax gobbledygook. And so being able to tell them, yes, these are options. This one is a good fit. Maybe this one isn't so good. And just help them navigate that realm, I think, has been really helpful so far to some clients that we've already had conversations about this topic with. And so I know it will be a value add for those clients that really start thinking about, you know what, I want to start the conversation. And I think it's a good time to start the conversation if you're in this, what we call danger zone, because you don't want to run into these advanced ideas quickly. You want to give them some thought. You want to make sure they work with your advisor's team efforts on your financial plan. And then you want to give time to the drafting attorney to actually do the paperwork in a way that will make sense. You'd never want to rush in and try to get one of these plans done at the last minute. It's too stressful. So, and it's not just about taxes, obviously. There's so much more, you know, your wills, passing on your legacy, carrying out your attention. Do you want to talk about some of the basics? Does everyone need a trust? You know, who can get away with just a will, estate planning 101, just some of that stuff for folks to give them a little education? Sure, that's a great segue into what do you actually need? We will start with everyone needs a will. Everyone 18 and older should have some written wishes on who do you want to be your beneficiaries? Who do you want to be in charge of your assets upon death? Who's going to distribute your assets? And on the flip side, if you have anyone that you don't want to take from your estate, if you want to disinherit, you should put that down too. So everyone should start with a will. A will is just a document that says, if I die, here's who should get certain assets. Here's my thoughts around various items. Wills are governed by courts. This is where the movies start to turn us wrong. Wills are ordered by the court and have to be overseen by a court process. When there is a will that has to be overseen by a court process, that means your personal information, your beneficiary's information is in the public record. Even if a process of having your asset distribution overseen by a court 
sounds pretty straightforward. Candidly, states such as Utah, Washington have a pretty straightforward probate court process for wills. Even if it's straightforward, it's still public record. If you just have investment accounts and a few other types of items, bank accounts, et cetera, and you have a will, it's pretty straightforward. You could probably get away with just a will. If you own real estate, if you live in California, you don't want to have just a will because the, our courts are too impacted to get many things done efficiently or on the cheaper side. It's quite expensive and lengthy. California, getting a judge to sign off on your will can take sometimes two to three years. So if you have real estate, if you have little kids, if you have a business, now we've jumped into, let's get a trust. A trust is more complete. It can be more robust. A court does not have to oversee a trust. So you can have a private transfer of assets. You can have a very efficient, you can have lots of tax planning. So many times people, once they have real estate, they jump into having a trust. So those are the two powerhouse distribution documents. And then you've got supplemental helper documents that every, everyone needs. A financial power of attorney. I know we deal with those a lot here at SEIA. An advanced directive or your healthcare proxy. So you're not having loved ones wonder what your wishes are upon some medical situation. And then if you have minor children, you want to nominate who you want to be their guardian. Together, all of these documents, we would say would be a basic escape plan. It can be a few pages long. It can be very detailed. You can go into all your hopes and dreams and thoughts around distributions to various beneficiaries, or you can keep it real simple and straightforward. And so every trust and will is different. Every state has slightly different laws around the verbiage. And you can get as creative or not creative as you want. One piece of advice, you want it to be as clear as possible. We try not to get too cute with our drafting words. And I know it's hard for non-attorneys to believe that because we see some trust that can be quite long and maybe boring, I dare say. But at the end of the day, you want whoever is reading your trust to be able to figure out quickly what your wishes are. Because if they can't, guess what? Then they go see somebody like me in my former life. They have to go to court and try to figure out what was it all about. And so maybe later or a different conversation, we can talk about what happened when a trust or a will has the wrong person involved, has the wrong language. Then you start talking about litigation costs and the dark side of estate planning. So you want to avoid that dark side. That's so interesting, right? So with someone who was formerly on that, I love the term, the dark side. So it's a part of what you were doing, if I heard you right, was going in and fixing where other people, other documents or attorneys had drafted things that weren't that clear and needed some interpretation. And that became something you would charge for versus doing it sort of making it simpler the first time. And maybe part of our role would be to coach or partner people through that, even though we don't physically draft these documents, but just have them be really clear so they can get a much better outcome. Is that fair characterization of what you were just saying? Yes, you're spot on very directly. Our goal here in this department is not only providing lots of great simple to implement information, but on the other side of it, using my litigation experience to say, here's what not to do, right? Here's how we can help you get to the right attorney to draft, because you're correct, this is not a law firm. I luckily just get to be part of the planning team. I get to be proactive. I'm not part of the cleanup crew anymore. But having been on that cleanup crew side, we can help the clients and guide them into potential options that might be best fit and also minimize risk, right? We don't want to get too complicated. If there is a family dynamic issue, let's address it. Let's address it in a simple way. It's not like the movies where if you disinherit someone, it's some shocking cliffhanging, 
part of a movie. It can be very direct. It can be loving in some ways. There's lots of reasons people disinherit. It's not be always just because of some negative thing. There can be positive reasons why. There can be tax reasons why. And so really just thinking it through from all these different angles, the goal is help the client avoid mine. They didn't even know we're there, right? Use my experience of seeing the worst drafted trust or the worst types of trustees and the most egregious things that can happen, unfortunately, in this space, particularly with successor trustees or older individuals, avoid that potential undue influence, avoid that elder abuse, et cetera, by having a plan that is already forward thinking. And many of the clients I've already talked to here when we're talking about things, we're telling them why this might fit their plan. And also, you know what, it fits their plan. If you think about from a financial standpoint, we wanna also try to mitigate that risk of losing assets in litigation. No litigation is cheap. When I left litigation, I think my minimum retainer was $50,000 with recurring reimbursements if I got too low. So you can see, very costly to litigate, very costly. So why, you know, why even open that door if you don't have to? A hundred percent. It's so planning focused. I love that. That probably made a lot of people's jaw drop. And that was your minimum, 50K. So it's just funny how so much get focus gets put on setting it up, you know, making the right, making these winning decisions. But what about the coaching to avoid these mistakes or pitfalls? Or you think of the doctor who gets you on a healthy lifestyle or lowering stress or eating right or all these things, avoidance. There's not really any money in that, but it's the right thing to do. There's money in a, a surgery or something like that. But so we're trying to avoid these litigation or these thoughts. And then something else you mentioned there, it might be good to touch on just the financial or elder abuse. I, you mentioned that. I see it. And I don't know that clients get the depth always the, of our relationships. And we're watching for that all the time with other family members. I've been really lucky that I haven't had to specifically experience that, but I'm really aware of how that can go or hear other stories. And someone sort of on the watch out, that's a value add but tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that and experience. You've probably seen a lot of it. It's not an uncommon practice, unfortunately. More and more with an aging population, we tend to be healthier as a nation. We're living longer. I started to see a real uptick in my practice when I was dealing with more complex estate plans, meaning clients had money or had assets, an uptick in potential financial elder abuse or undue influence. And I think it is great to have an advisor team involved because as you said, I could always tell when clients had an advisor, somebody planning with them, somebody who knew them well that could say, wait a minute, you know, what you're telling me about this person, this third party doesn't ring true from what I've known from you from the past decade or more. So let's get on the phone. I think that is the first line of defense. And I could always tell when a client had an advisor, things were pretty shut down quickly. And that is amazing. And as you say, you're constantly on the watch, you're always on the lookout. And so I think that is fantastic. And then I think as a second line of defense, there are things that clients can put into their trust and powers of attorney to help them not be a target, particularly these millionaires next door and above. People that have some assets to lose are always a target. And so, of course, having the advisor there, but then also putting things in the document to make it hard for the client to move money randomly to third parties when it seems untoward. And what does that mean? You know, what does it look like? having parameters around caregivers and what caregivers are allowed to do. Caregivers are fantastic. They're amazing. They do a great job. There are some bad apples in the bunch that take advantage of that. Putting some parameters around money movement, particularly when it's not a family member or it's a distant family member, 
as you can imagine, as people start to decline or there is a passing of, say, a first spouse, there are those vulture types that start to swoop in to, quote, help the situation, but really they're looking for cash. And I would tell everyone that's planning elder abuse and undue influence, we imagine sometimes what it looks like in the movies, you know, a very aggressive criminal type activity. And that might be the case, but that wasn't the case that I saw in all of my cases. It was always a well-meaning neighbor or a caregiver or a family member who was taking care of mom and dad or a neighbor that was trying to be helpful and maybe for good reasons or not, would kind of insert themselves and become a talking point or other really involved with a particular client. And then slowly over time, gaining more and more access to the client, especially if they are helping that client take them to the doctor or bring them meals. Now they've got their ear. And the next thing you know, sometimes in the cases that I had worked on in the past, they'd have financial trouble or they'd say, you know, I really want a gift or sometimes put a little pressure for money. And the next thing you know, this client that's trying to do good is letting gobs of cash go out the door, lots of products go out the door, their assets, their tangible personal property, their jewelry starts to go missing and it can get very egregious from there. So having advisors involved, having parameters so that, gee, you know, if grandma starts making changes to her trust multiple times within a successive period and letting assets run out the door, now we need to start thinking about how can we get involved. To let the cat out of the bag, one of our thoughts here at SEIA is working with corporate trustees sounds big, sounds expensive. It, it isn't. There are ways that we can partner and we're still looking at a best fit, somebody that would fit our company's model. Looking at ways that we can partner with corporate trustees so that we could have in a right fit situation, again, might not be for everyone, but have a corporate trustee, this independent, all they do is this kind of trust work. If needed, have them step in, do all the things that are required while still carving out investment advisory services that the advisors know how to do. And so really coming together and circle around the client in a way that makes sense, again, help insulate certain kinds of people from undue influence or, or elder abuse, or just people that are super busy and their family members either don't know or don't want this job in the future, right? So we're already thinking maybe two generations from now. So lots to talk about there. The financial elder abuse and undue influence cases were the ones that I was doing primarily before I switched and started to work for this team, which is part of the planning. It's very draining. It's horrible to see. It, it breaks apart families. It's super costly. And it's good work, right? It's good work to try to work for the good side. But I would rather, as I said, work for the planning piece of it and stop the cleanup because it is sometimes too late. Sometimes yeah. you can win a case and the money's gone. Big time. Yeah. Just to have the awareness that you actually specialized in that space, or if we see something to have some extra eyes or ear, it usually is spent, right? Or it's spent down and then the cost to get retain somebody who could correct it is expensive, but they usually spend the money pretty quickly. And then that you could just prove this. I've heard a lot of stories that somebody did it, but guess what? The money's already spent. So how are we going to, what are we going to do? There is no restitution. It's really sad. I heard a wild one, this guy, this is kind of off on the side here, but the filmmaker Warren Miller, have you heard of this guy? He made all these iconic ski movies over like 50 yeah. years. And he was kind of a workaholic. He was off somewhere in Europe filming and really into that. By the time he'd gotten pretty successful and he gets this call that checks were bouncing and his, he had no money left and he was just shocked because he'd accumulated a fair amount. Well, he left his mother and his sister in charge of his business and they just cleared him out. And he found out after the fact and I guess he never spoke to them again, but that was just a, an interesting story on the side. But yeah. It's very common. 
very common yeah. for not necessarily parents, but definitely siblings. This is unfortunately a lot of the cases I see and have experienced. It's a sibling. I guess that's shocking in some ways. It might not be shocking to me anymore based on my background, but it is just really sad, probably all around. It's just a really sad truth, unfortunately. It's really sad. I've been really fortunate. We haven't seen that with clients. I've heard so many stories or heard other cases, or I've have had folks where they've had sibling issues and not so much getting into an account that we managed, but it is it's not surprising. You know, life is tough and somebody accumulates some assets and somebody else's life isn't at a great place and they just want to take those funds. It's easier. So we're there to maybe put some firewalls. We don't mean to scare people, but people know these things are out there. Maybe just put some additional protections and have that conversation so they could they could have a strategy around it and do all that stuff, avoid taxes, get their intentions set up correctly just an extra resource for folks. I know we're starting to bump up against our time, unfortunately, here. I'm enjoying this. There's so many areas we could go in to on this, but this was just introductory to let you know we have additional resources, me and my team and April, and which is fantastic. April, any kind of sort of final thoughts or themes maybe to part before we kind of wrap up here? Well, I think to bring it full circle, I think... One, you're right. We're not here to scare anyone. We both have some war stories we could share. But really what the people that are listening can take away is we've been in seeing all these different situations. So part of our goal is to just make that part of the plan clients don't have to worry about, right? We're just here to guard against as many things as possible and make it an easy conversation for people around basically any question they have that involves the state, and then that folds in tax and financial planning. I assume that everyone might have a question at some point. Of course, they know how to reach out. But we're just super excited to bring this area of SEIA into the forefront and then really just come along all the advisors and teams and clients to just be a real value add. So this is just the beginning. I can hardly wait to see where it heads. Me too. I mean, it's really exciting because I deal with this stuff all the time, but to have additional resources for the benefits of clients. So if anybody's listening or they have questions or thoughts and we get them all the time, we can bring this into the fray and April and her team and it's exciting. So I'm sensing another part two to this somewhere down the line because there's a lot of other areas as this starts (laughs) to unfold, but not to put you on the spot here, but I think it's great. The time just flew. Very exciting about just the planning opportunities in the beginning. And so thanks so much for joining us and really appreciate it, April. Thanks so much for having me. And I would love to to come back and chit chat. There's just so many great things that we could talk about. So I would love to. And thank you so much again for today's invite. It was super fun. Oh, terrific. Yeah, we'll hear some more of your stories and wisdom. That sounds great. Let's plan on it. Thanks for those who are listening. I hope everyone makes it a great day. And we hope to see you again on the next and future episodes. Thanks for being here. Thank you for listening to the Millionaire Next Door podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Signature Estate and Investment Advisors, Signature Estate and Investment Advisors, LLC, SEIA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor. However, such registration does not imply a certain level of skill or training, and no inference to the contrary should be made. Securities offered through Signature Estate Securities, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through SEIA, LLC, 2121 Avenue of the Stars, Suite 1600, Los Angeles, California, 90067. Telephone number 310-712-2323.